Welcome to another episode of In My Own Words. I'm your host, Corey Timms, and with me I have my friend and mentor, state senator and Senate Majority Leader, Kimberly Leifert. Senator, Hi. thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, Corey. It's a pleasure. Um, one of the things that, and it's really a, one of the premises behind the show, is to be able to not only celebrate the successes and the accolades, but be able to also talk about some of the tough moments, some of the struggles and the losses. And in um, 2020, you pursued um, the Senate presidency after uh, former Senate President uh, Cullerton retired, um, and uh, you were unsuccessful in the bid. Um, talk, talk to us about how um, how you were able to grapple with with such a public loss, um, and ultimately still um, be passionate about state senate um and you know still a leader and a trailblazer in the senate i feel like when it happened um that i was having an out-of-body experience i just didn't understand what all was happening and then it came to me quickly the portrayal and some of the things that took shape and i had never lost a race before mm -hmm. and this was a different kind of race because this wasn't a race of your constituency you know this was a race an inside race of, of of your colleagues judging whether or not you ought to be in this leadership role mm -hmm. and so i always knew that it was a very different race and all i knew for me was that i had worked really hard and built myself up to a place where I was the first black woman Senate majority leader yeah. in the state. And I knew that I enjoyed the level of responsibility and that I could be a really good president of the Senate. And so not winning that race didn't mean that all the years that I had spent um, uh, in my passion and champion education and raising the minimum wage three times mm -hmm. and, you know, champion from preschool to, you know, uh, to higher education issues, yep. um, just being on the front line for the Black Caucus and creating, you know, things to happen. Um, there, I felt like I kicked the ceiling in. I wasn't successful, but I, I showed some other women and young girls on how they too can rise to a place um, unbeknownst to them that they would get there and then have the opportunity to go for the number one spot. Yeah. Like no one would have told me at 30 that I, when I first arrived there mm -hmm. to a place where I was never even acknowledged yeah. often that I would be running for the number one seat. So for me, it was just opportunity mm -hmm. and it was the same opportunity as before. Like you want me to do what, <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's go, let's do this. And so, um, I was, I was disappointed of course, but it, it doesn't subtract who I am. It doesn't take away, um, all that I've contributed and what I still have to offer. Yeah. And so moving forward for me was more important and to leave the legislature on my own terms when yeah. I'm ready to leave the legislature when my constituency says, you know, we're not pleased with your performance, then that's when I'll leave the legislature, not right. from losing an uh, inside race. So you served as joint um, caucus chair from 2015 to 2021. Uh, for the Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. And um, during your tenure, the Black Caucus released a four pillar legislative agenda that focused on criminal justice reform, uh, economic equity, education, and health care. Mm -hmm. And you actually served as chief co sponsor for House Bill 2170 under the education pillar. Um, can you talk a little bit about? What ultimately made you guys decide to do the the, the pillar agenda um, and why at that moment was it so critical? The George Floyd murder was at a time when we were all across the world was on shutdown. Mm -hmm. It's the pandemic, you know, that nobody understand, nobody knows. So stay at home. Yeah. So everyone's staying at home and they're all watching TV and they're all listening to the media. Mm -hmm. There's not many other outlets. You cannot leave your house. Then we witness George Floyd. We, we witness this man's, you know, knee on this guy's neck, a brother, until he can't breathe. Yeah. Right. 
And um, we begin as a caucus to have, and um, we have what we call a joint caucus, Corey, um, outside of just the Illinois Senate, it's comprised of all levels of government. Um, so there is um, federal uh, officers who are uh, elected officials that are part of our joint commission. They're city, county, state, all levels of government. And so we begin to do these, you know, um, go around from the south side to the west side to the west suburbs to the south suburbs having days of action mm -hmm. and um you know the senate president attended the governor attended and they attended all four of them you yeah. know and you know we're saying we want more money you know for black communities and and we're debating you know these police brutality and we're you know these lived experiences that we have um i just felt like that was not enough I, I just, we can't stop on, you know, chanting about what has to change. We're the change agents. We yeah. want to see the change. We have to be the change agent. And so I had no idea what I was going to do or how I was going to do it. But I knew that there was more that had to be done, that must be done, that shall be done. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an option. But here we are at this time in history where we have to cease this moment everybody's watching we have to be on one accord so i called one of our educators and i said god's given me a vision you know and and it happens to me all the time that you know i need to do more and i said and i, I i'm not exactly sure where to get started or how to get it started because it's so big in my mind on what we need to do and so i requested that the black caucus foundation host the clock is a education, you know, um, summit, a retreat mm -hmm. so that I could, you know, galvanize their support around this thing that I didn't know what that thing was or what it was going to be. Yeah. But let me throw out to them what I'm feeling and thinking and let me learn from the caucus what they're feeling and thinking. And then in my leadership role, let me shape it. Right. And so um, I just asked them the question, what is impeding the success of the black community? Why, why are we 50 years later from what MLK was saying and it's still happening? Why, still talking about the same issues. The same issues. Why, why is this happening? You know, so it was kind of like having a dartboard where you're just throwing out things that, you know. And so we just, we were throwing, we were throwing. And that board was just filling up and filling up and filling up and filling up. And I told the caucus, I just need you all to trust me. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I promise you, you give me a couple of days. Let me pray on this, think on this, figure this out. And I just need you to trust me. So I took all everything that we talked about and start categorizing it. Yeah. And then I came back to the caucus and I said, this sounds all like criminal justice issues. This is all education. This is all in the healthcare medical space. And this is all in, in economic development, the economics, you know, what's, you know, your family's not making, your parents is broke. You yeah. know, we, we grow up poor. Thank God my mother was so amazing. I didn't even know I was poor for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, why, why, why are generations of children constantly be being born in poverty, yeah, you know, in the concentrated poverty that exists in the black community. And so I took back and I shared with my colleagues in the caucus, the breakdown. And then I said, let's come up with headings and we're going to call them our pillars. Mm -hmm. And so literally the pillar system was born with these headings, with these items underneath. And then I said, OK, now we need to be very strategic on how we manage this because we're in a pandemic. The Senate is the only um, chamber that is allowed to have standard structured meetings on Zoom. Mm. The House didn't have an avenue to even convene at that time. Yeah. And the Speaker at that time had never acknowledged the movement. He never said, I support the Black Caucus. He never support, said, I'm sorry about what happened to George Floyd. Just nothing came from the Speaker. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a, an, an idea of how do we maneuver in this space because we are on the brink of solving systemic 
challenges that are embedded in our state government, that are embedded in the very policies and the procedures that we enact as state legislators. Mm -hmm. So we have a serious job to do. I took it very serious. I spent 12 hour days for eight months sitting at that computer, wow. sitting on Zoom, meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting until we had all of the pillars in place. We had um, national experts come in. We, mm -hmm. we did a three-day retreat. We had national experts on every subject. We had, and we took their feedback. We sent them ours. They sent it back. You know, we did this and this. You know, yep. we did the push and pull for mm -hmm. a while. And all I asked the caucus to do was to keep it to yourself. If you ain't never kept a secret before <laughs> <laughs> i need you to do it right now <laughs> this is the time I, no pillow talking <laughs> no pillow talk if you feel like you just gotta tell somebody call me up anytime and tell me what you feel because the minute you let the press get a hold of this or the media or the capital facts or mm -hmm. any other fraction and, and what we're trying to do, get out, opposition is going to build so quickly over this thing that yeah. we wouldn't even have time to complete our task of building it. Yeah. Right. And so we stayed together. We stayed together. Never leaked out. I was able to tell the press anytime they would direct the press, call Kim, call our chairman, and I would tell them we're working on it. Mm -hmm. What are y'all doing? What is it going to consist of? We're, we're working, working on, on it. it. You know, well, what, what is it going to consist of? The black community. Mm -hmm. That's it. Our agenda. The Illinois Legislative Black Caucus agenda to rid Illinois systemic racism. That's what we have. Our agenda. Hi, I'm Tawana Streeter, host of DIY DEI. Tune in on Mondays at 7.30 p.m. as I discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Because there's so many different voices, especially in the Black Caucus, um, different interests. Um, folks have d represent different communities and constituencies. How did you get folks to kind of corral around? These are these are the pillar areas, and ultimately, these are the um, specific um, nodes that we're going to focus on. Um, it's as a part of the legislation. Well, because we've been working. Um, we had already had subcommittees already established over different headings and topics. And so it was very easy to say, okay, the co-chairs of these subcommittees, you know, who else want to be a part of that? And it took a lot of work. I mean, mm -hmm. we spent hours and hours on this stuff of, of having meetings to say, okay, here's your area. Now you guys go you know, do your thing, come back and report back. I mean, this was weekly. This yeah. this was done weekly, you know, over over a three month period just to get the initial bones and get it, you know, really to a place where we could like, okay, here, now look at this. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what we were able to do on our second round of the same advocates that we had worked with initially. Okay. So now this is where we are. Did we miss anything? Did, you know, we, we talked to a number of professors and, you know, high level, high educated people, you know, what is the history telling you? What, what, what are we missing in mm -hmm. this space? Right. And so, um, and, and so that back and forth gave us that clarity that we needed. Now, um, unbeknownst to me in the education space, many members felt that we had just passed the evidence-based funding model and that there wasn't much to do in education. I say, are you kidding me? Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> right. And so I'm, we're going to take education from preschool to high school to workforce development, and we're going to rip that apart. Absolutely. And we're going to use the advocacy groups who constantly get renewed grants over and over again to explain to us why they're not moving our children. Mm -hmm. Right. I, let them tell us what it is that we need to do to better help them yeah. move our children. Yeah. Right. So it was a system of 
all of the time that I had spent in the legislature, I felt like it just had all came to that moment where I knew what to do mm -hmm. and I knew how to do it. I just needed the caucus to believe in me and to, to, to give me that support and rally around me. And then once they start seeing it happen and they saw what was shaping up, the enthusiasm was huge. Yeah. And I, they were like, well, how are we going to do this? Like, I said, we're going to have omnibus legislation. And it, I mean, like, pretty much all, the co all of my colleagues said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and this is when my history dates me to in 2000. Mm -hmm. I was the only, you know, member um, besides one other state representative who's not as active in the caucus who had experienced the legislature having an omnibus bill. Mm -hmm. And so when it happened in 2000, here we are in what, 2019, 2020, hadn't happened before, but yeah. I knew it could. So. <laughs> See that experience, that experience Ooh, was coming it's through. It's a good teacher, baby. <laughs> it's a good experience, it's a good teacher. Speaking of all of your experience, right? You, This year marks your 25th year in yeah, the Illinois wow. Senate. What do you want your legacy to be? What do you hope your legacy is? For many years, my passion has always been education and youth development, coming from that criminal justice juvenile place and, and lending up to how do we instill education in our, our young people, um, giving them better quality education, not just an education. They're mm -hmm. getting an education, but a quality education right. that will allow them to compete in this society, mm -hmm. you know, how do we take a fractured child like me who's showing up, right? Who's showing up but needs some other outside resources. Yeah. So where are the social workers? Where are the, tr you know, where is the truant officers? Where, where are all of the extracurricular activities that were able to consume me? Where are they? Yeah. You know, now you're we're missing all of these distractions for children who need to be distracted mm -hmm. from things that are beyond their control. So now what do I do? So I've been living my whole career on a legacy that will be left that is clear that I that I love her. Yeah. That I'm committed to the black community that I love my people and that I want all of us to have a chance to thrive. It's unnecessary for any community, the whole community, to constantly be generations and generations and generations of poverty. I, I just felt like we deserve better. And so I want my legacy to be somebody that cared enough to stay in the fight, mm -hmm. that cared enough to be that progressive legislator when there was no word for for that, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't have a place. I didn't fit. Yeah. And then when I asked questions and challenged the systemic racism, then I became the angry black woman. Yeah. And then I didn't know what to do with myself at that point mm -hmm. other than what my mother told me. Mind your business, do your work. <laughs> so put my head back down, right? Uh -huh. And do what I need to do. I had one other piece of advice along the way that really made a big difference on helping me build my legacy. And it was from a woman named Linda Harker. She was the secretary of the Senate. She had served through Republicans and Dems and back and forth. So she was well-liked, well-respected, and did her job amazingly well. And she walked up to me. No one else has said a word to me. I'm on, like, day three. Mm -hmm. And she's like, hey, kiddo, you mind if I call you kiddo? And I was like, mm-mm. <laughs> like, <I'm, laughs> call me whatever you want to call me right now. I'm just glad you're talking to me. Right? <laughs> And she says, you mind if I give you a piece of advice? And I said, oh, no, please. She says, you know, a lot of people are around here doing a little too much and spreading themselves thin. Mm -hmm. She said, what is it that you like? She says, make yourself good at one thing that you can do. Make yourself an expert yeah. in a subject. I said, well, I love education and youth development. And I gave her a little bit of where I came from. And she says, then that's what you should focus on. And she directed me to Senator Vince DiMuzio, who at that time was on the Senate Education Committee. He was considered the dean of the Senate. He was a professor at a community college in his district, and he was just well known and liked and loved. Mm -hmm. And so I went to him and I said, hey, I'm going to sit next to you in education because I really want to learn a lot from you. Ms. Harker suggested that I do. And from then, it just went. So I've been a part of the Senate Education uh, Committee as as a member, as a vice chair or the chair for my full 25 years in the wow. legislature. And I've been I've become known to be 
uh, a champion in education and an Absolutely. expert around that subject. So I just, the advice that I received from my mother, Ms. Hawker, has really shaped and helped me build my career. And so I would like to leave a legacy of, of, of passion and compassion, I should say, that I really loved giving in that space. I love that. And final question is, sure. who is Kimberly Lightford in your own words? <laughs> I think Kimberly Lightford is an around the way girl, okay. right? <laughs> she, she loves her. Um, she loves her community. Uh, she loves music. Mm -hmm. uh, and she loves taking things that look like there, there is, a, is, you know, uh, broken, you know, shallow. And, and helping that shine that diamond in the rough. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she loves interior decorating to taking a person and doing the very same thing. Yeah. She loves to mentor. She loves, she loves giving back in that way. She loves taking that young little black girl and giving her everything that she didn't have that yeah. was missing. And then she also does that in the same adult professional space where new members come in and she would say to them, you don't have to, I've already done it for you. Yeah. And so she's been really good at helping, you know, um, share um, her with, with, with new members. So I think she's um, a teacher in so many ways um, with a different kind of degree. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of mentoring, um, I do it at the end of every show. Um, and I think uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't do it with you. I, I'm big on giving flowers. And I just want to thank you because you have been a mentor, a friend, somebody that I can call and um, will help direct me and, you know, show me where the landmines are. And I think to the point that you made earlier about sometimes that help from the generation of, uh, ahead of you isn't always there. You've been a, a huge champion of mine and a huge help to me. So I just want to oh. make sure that I give you your flowers and tell you thank you and I appreciate you. Oh, well, thank you, Corey. And I accept my flowers. <laughs> you know, we can go to lunch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, thank you. It's been a pleasure knowing you over these years. And it's like you're one of those, you're, you're one of those seeds. You know, I, I truly believe that, you know, that we ought to plant seeds and create and grow trees that we'll never sit under. Mm -hmm. And and I find you to be that person like, I believe you reap what you sow. Absolutely. I do. Absolutely. And so if I could sow into you, you know, and you could give me that energy back by being successful and constantly growing, mm -hmm. that's how I see you. Every time we talk, I'm over here, I'm doing this, <laughs> I'm busy doing that. I'm like, hey, what's next? <laughs> like, Corey, where can I find you? So <laughs> it's like you'll ask a question or want a little advice and I give it to you and you just run with it. Yeah. And that's what it's really about. Just being able to bounce things off someone, get a get another perspective, you know, have that different you know, um, feeling that maybe you just don't know. You're not aware. You haven't been in that space. Yeah. So here's this person telling you, oh, I'm not sure. Or maybe so. If it does nothing more, but just help you look at things differently. And that's what I've learned, too, in this fullness. You know, the, the whole across the aisle, Democrat, Republican kind of thing. I learned earlier on to not just constantly sit with at a table with all like minds. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't leave with nothing but a like mind. Yeah. And so I've constantly put myself in positions where I could learn something differently. I could hear something differently. It would make me go back and rethink things and reshape, you know. And so I, I recognize that in you. So keep up the excellent work. And well, congratulations you, on this show. And thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for joining thank today. Thank you.